Hey guys, I'm Nathan from Arms and Armor. If you've been watching our videos, you know we've been doing a bunch of tests with sharp weapons, edge-on-edge -edge contact, and weapons against armor to see how they interact. And today, I want to give a little bit of a summation of some of the stuff we've learned and try to think through what it means for attempts to recreate sword fighting in the modern era. Stay tuned. So a couple weeks ago, we did a test between two sword blades where we used edge-on-edge -edge contact uh, to make a parry to see what happened. Right? And what we saw was that the blades notched and they bound. We then did another video about how to sharpen out those notches, but we didn't really talk about why you need to do that. Right? And the reason is, if you don't, you create a weak spot in the blade. So this is my sword that I was doing a whole bunch of tests with, and you can see that it broke. Right? And it didn't break because of anything wrong with the sword, right? The grain structure is beautiful. There's no flaws in it. It broke because you can see that chip right here, right? That was a deep, wedge that was cut into the edge of this blade by the other blade in our test. And then I was doing more testing with this sword without grinding out that notch, including hitting some more armor, trying to cut through cloth armor with the damaged blade. And in fact, when I went and did a fairly powerful cut against a piece of cloth armor on a dummy, uh, the blade just fractured and broke. Now, this is actually something we should expect to happen, right? I'm not saying blades should break all the time. What I'm saying is that chips and notches like this are weak points in blades. And that's one of the reasons you have to grind them out uh, before a crack spreads and propagates across the blade, right? Another sword blade hitting this is a wedge, right? The edge of the blade is a wedge, and when it cuts into this edge, it spreads that material and it can cause a crack, uh, which can cause a blade to fail like this. Kind of looks like Narsil, huh? Uh, it's kind of scary. The end of the blade went flying. I didn't catch it on video because I was just doing a bunch of uh, practice experimentation. Uh, but this was actually pretty common, right? There are all kinds of medieval and Renaissance paintings and tapestries that show battlefields littered with broken weapons. And this raises a bunch of important questions for us, right, about how weapons worked, how people expected them to work, and what kinds of concerns medieval warriors might have had about, say, parrying with the edge or, you know, hitting someone's armor. Uh, in a way that was likely uh, to break their weapon. So we'll examine this in, in detail here. We know that if a blade is deeply notched, that's a weak point that may cause it to fail. But there are a whole bunch of variables that'll influence how likely it is to fail, right? So these are the two swords that we were doing these tests with. One of them is essentially a 15th century German longsword type 18. The other blade is an earlier fullered blade. Now it's interesting that this earlier blade didn't nick as deeply as the later medieval blade. Right? And this, I think, is because the edge geometry is substantially different. Right? Here's the end of my former sword. It's an X sword. Uh, this sword, with a diamond cross section that's relatively thin, tapers out to a very fine edge uh, that's for cutting. And in fact, this had been sharpened for cutting tatami. And so was, it was very sharp. I was using it for essentially as a modern cutting competition sword. That edge being so fine and being sharpened uh, to such a fine edge made it less durable, right? That thinner material on the edge was something that uh, was not as durable as this sword, which is not as sharp. It 
sharp, but it's not as sharp. You wouldn't be, you know, cutting through 20 layers of linen uh, with this readily. Uh, additionally, this fullered blade really changes the geometry. And one thing that a fuller does, right, people always talk about it uh, as reducing the weight of the blade. It does that, but one of the things it really does is it moves material from the center of the blade closer to the edge, right? So you have a edge geometry on these that is a bit thicker closer to the edge, right? So in, in essence, it reinforces the edge and makes the geometry and the angle of the edge less acute, right? a little bit more like an ax than like a razor blade. This seems to make that edge a bit more durable for edge on edge contact. And so blades that have a more oblique geometry at the edge may hold up better to edge on edge contact and blades that are less sharp may hold up better uh, when there's edge on edge contact. Another thing that all of these tests have made me think about uh, is how hitting armor impacts your sword in a battle, right? So we assume that a sword is pretty sharp at the start of a battle, but it's gonna get dull really fast if you're hitting steel and iron, right? So here's some of the chain mail that I've hit uh, with that sword. Here's a piece of uh, uh, 14 gauge steel uh, that I made into a quick van brace kind of thing. Uh, these are the two places that I hit it with this sword. And one of the things I noticed is that the places where I hit that armor are not sharp at all anymore, right? So you can see all of these nicks up and down the edge of that blade. This is where I had hit those armors prior to, and some of them after, uh, the edge on edge contact test. And it's kind of funny, I always hold my sword the same way because there's a seam in the leather. So the way I hold it, this side was always my true edge and this side was my false edge. You can see the false edge is still sharp. It will cut me if I, I press on it. But the true edge where I've done all these tests isn't sharp anymore, right? It's like a butter knife. And it's because I was hitting it against steel, against chain mail, and against uh, you know two dozen layers of linen, all of this cloth, right? That easily takes the edge off of a sword. So if you're in a battle and you've hit uh, someone else's sword, someone's weapons, their armor, uh, your sword isn't gonna be very sharp for very long. So how do I know that medieval swords are like this too? Well, harder steels tend to hold an edge better uh, this is 6150 carbon steel that we tempered at 52 Rockwell. That's harder than the vast majority of medieval swords were. So they would have held an edge even less well uh, than this, given all of that uh, battering uh, that happened. So finally, the damage that this poor sword took uh, from hitting armor, uh, but mainly from that deep edge-on-edge -edge contact uh, really kind of brings me back to some debates in HEMA from years past, uh, in particular the debate about parrying and whether you should parry with the strong of your flat or with the edge of your sword. Right? I can see the concern, right, because parrying with the edge will essentially has a decent chance of destroying your sword, right? of making it fail. And you don't really want that to happen if you're in a battle. Uh, nevertheless, I think we have a great deal of, ev of evidence that people did in fact parry with the edge. But there's a few different kinds of ways to parry with the edge. Right? If you watched the video where I was parrying, uh, clearly I didn't want Craig to accidentally kill me with a sword. So he was cutting at my sword and I was cutting at his sword, edge to edge, boom. Uh, which is a bit artificial. It's not what you'd normally do, 
And it's not what we're really told to do, which is when someone strikes at you, you strike their sword, right? Think of kind of a, a Zorn Howe uh, uh, type situation where the edges aren't usually meeting, boom, right edge to edge. Instead, we tend to have a more oblique angle, uh, which I think will result in less deep edge damage and probably substantially less risk of fracturing. And so that's something uh, that we have to think about. Another thing we have to think about is that it's one of the reasons that knights and professional warriors carried multiple weapons, right? You had a dagger, you had a sword, you had a polearm, you had a spear, you had an ax maybe, right? You had all of these things because in the heat of battle, it was very likely that some of your weapons would fail, right? That they would break because you're doing things to them that are at the very edge of their performance capabilities, right? Uh, it's like in modern warfare, right? If anyone's been watching the Ukraine-Russia conflict, right? There's all of this military equipment that's totally destroyed, right? Tanks, all kinds of stuff. It's armored, but it still got destroyed during war. Does that mean it sucks? No, right? It means that weapons of war are vulnerable to the vagaries of war, right? If we could make an invincible weapon, there wouldn't be any war anymore. There would just be one person who was in charge because they had an invincible weapon, right? So the fact that a sword can break from edge on edge contact, even if it's an excellent sword with great grain structure that's properly hardened, that's properly tempered, that's of superior steel to medieval steel, right? Doesn't mean that we're doing something wrong, right? It means that maybe we're thinking about these weapons in a way that's not uh, particularly historical. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is we might ask, well, if swords were breaking all the time, how come we don't have all kinds of broken swords represented in museums and books? Right? Instead, we have all of these swords that appear whole. Well, there are a bunch of reasons for that. Right? Number one, these were expensive materials back in the day, and steel and iron can be recycled. Right? So if you broke a sword or you found a broken sword, you probably didn't just keep it broken unless it had some significance. Instead, you recycled it. Right? So like this sword, the hilt, is great, right? It's in perfect condition. The blade's broken. So I would replace this blade, right? I'd get a new blade <laughs> for my sword. And that would be a normal part of having a sword. And there would have been plenty of cutlers around who could have done that for me to mount a new blade on my sword. Uh, additionally, uh, broken weapons, unless they're super unique, don't tend to get featured in a lot of publications, right? The things that have been sexy to collect and to display have been items that are rare and intact. And it'd be really interesting to go to a bunch of museums, look through you know, their collections that aren't displayed and see how many broken weapons uh, we come across. Uh, even so, there's gonna be selection bias, right? Because armories, uh, in the medieval and renaissance period, tended not to keep broken weapons, right? They kept weapons that were in good shape that could be used. And if they broke, they refurbished them, brought them to a furbisher, <laughs> or uh, chucked them, <laughs> right? So those things really didn't get preserved that well. So there's a bunch of places to go from here uh, with all of this uh, testing. Uh, we're gonna continue to do it and I look forward to your thoughts on some of these things. I'm sorry I didn't catch on video the unfortunate destruction of my trusty sword, um, but looks kind of like Narsil or something, the way it's broken, so cool. Uh, we'll keep exploring and uh, we wanna hear from you. Thank you.